Okay, if anyone else comes, I might have to stop and admit them to the Zoom room, but uh, yeah, for the most part, I think we're good to go here. So thank you for those of you who took the time to come out and attend on Zoom for my master's thesis event. Uh, it's been a long time coming, about a year and a half now I've been working on this uh, thesis, which is very vast, as you can see here, for those of you that are in person. Um, it's about critical race theory in Iowa, specifically I analyzed the Moine Register's coverage of the um, issues surrounding critical race theory, the 1619 project, and other related curriculum in the state, um, whether or not it passed, how they discussed it, um, legislation-wise, the school districts, etc. So, um, we'll go ahead and get started here. The first thing I have, and I can get this to move, is um, I had to figure out the issue. Why was I even going to research this topic? So the reason why I was interested in researching this was because Iowa banned critical race theory, um, education, 1619 project, etc. And I wanted to know why. Um, when I was doing my undergrad degree at the University of Northern Iowa, I was supposed to uh, participate in an internship opportunity to graduate from my undergrad in political communication um, that was working to implement the 1619 project in the school district there. Um, and because of the um, conversations surrounding the topic, et cetera. Um, I was unable to obviously do that opportunity, and I'll talk about that more later. And I don't know why that was, so I went into this uh, research with that mindset. So to start off, the 1619 Project, it's a multimedia essay produced by uh, the award-winning uh, journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones, and it was launched in August 2019. Nicole Hannah-Jones is pictured above there. Um, it, is, it was launched to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first enslaved Africans in the British colony of Virginia, which happened in 1619. And the project specifically examines the legacy of slavery and the contributions of black individuals in America from a new lens that is previously not um, discussed or talked about anything like that. So obviously presenting this new idea um, comes with its own set of backlashes, um, specifically um, the idea that um, the country started on a different date than what is previously believed by our whole society. Um, right now it's believed that the U.S. Um, as a country started, the foundational start of the country was on uh, July 4th, 1776, um, which was the date that the Declaration of Independence was signed in the, the uh, American Constitution in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, in addition to the project here that uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones Nicole Hannah -Jones, um, created, um, the Pulitzer Center created the 1619 Project curriculum that challenges the reframe U.S. history by marking the year when the first applicants arrived on U.S. Um, soil as a foundational date. So this um, curriculum will be implemented in schools uh, given the opportunity. So now we're going to talk about a few, a few of the people that were important um, in creating the theory itself. Um, so here we have um, advocates Derek Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw, Richard Delgado, and Alan Freeman, who were all trailblazers and key individuals um, in this field of thought. They began considering the idea to um, even start this field of thought after um, they concluded that the social and economic um, conditions of Africans in the U.S. had not improved following the passing of several civil rights acts um, in the 1960s. Um, in addition, the abolishment of several um, Jim Crow laws that were um, enacted within certain states. Um, and then these laws promoted segregation, food service, education, marriage, public transportation, and many more areas as well. So now to kind of get into what the theory is, critical race theory challenges the dominant ideology around race, such as colorblindness and meritocracy, for which the 1619 Project is also supporting. Colorblindness relates to looking at an individual and saying that you do not see color um, within their skin, whether or not there is, um, I guess you see it, you don't think there's color presented versus if you do. Um, that's what colorblindness is, saying that you don't see color in people. And then meritocracy is uh, meaning that individuals are assigned positions of power or influence based on their abilities and achievements rather than their social, cultural, or economic backgrounds. Studies that use the CRT blend show that racism is a powerful force in US society and has become normalized the point where inequalities and disparities are rarely questioned in our society. So now I'm going to go into a little bit about my internship opportunity that I previously mentioned uh, before. So um, in the spring of 2021, I was supposed to do an internship opportunity with the Waterloo West Community um, School District, specifically in their high school, which is pictured at the top right here. Um, it's located in Waterloo, Iowa, which um, is uh, right next to Cedar Falls, Iowa, which is where the University of Northern Iowa is located, where I got my undergraduate um, degree. So, um, unfortunately, as I said, Iowa had other plans, so the Waterloo schools had to withdraw their funding to Nicole Hannah Jones' um, implementation of the CRT and 1619 uh, project curriculum in the Waterloo West High School. And uh, in addition to this, the funding for my internship opportunity was also withdrawn, um, which had a bunch of, a multitude of um, 
you know, effects. I had to scramble and figure out how I was going to graduate in time because I already had planned at that point to go to school here for my master's degree. Um, and then in addition, I didn't get to do um, something that was really important to me, being an African American individual in the state. So um, because of that, I was wondering why this happened. Why was the 1619 Project and Nicole Hannah Jones um, education and curriculum so controversial? And um, I wanted to answer. So for those reasons, um, that's why I'm researching this topic. Um, so Waterloo, Iowa is a metropolitan area in the north of Iowa, which neighbors Cedar Falls, as I mentioned. And when I arrived in Cedar Falls, I did notice distinct differences in the two communities because they are right next to each other. Um, and both have several, I mean, Cedar Falls has one high school, but they have several students, um, like they're a five-day school in comparison to class rankings in Iowa, which is the highest it goes, um, in comparison to Waterloo East and Waterloo West, those being 4A ranked schools. So um, because of this, I noticed that the schools in Waterloo had outdated facilities, and then in addition, they seemed to have high faculty turnover um, compared to the Cedar Falls High School, which is pictured at the bottom left, as it currently is. Um, but obviously, as you can see at the bottom right, there's something that happened um, to that school district. Um, so in uh, 2020, they got approval to build a new prestigious facility. Um, as I pictured there, I put the model down. Um, it's currently still in the uh, preliminary construction processes, so there's not really a up-to-date image I can give you, but that's um, the closest thing to what it will look like as, at this point. Um, and I was wondering why this school district over, you know, Waterloo East and Waterloo West that aesthetically or visibly um, seemed to need some sort of revamping and upgrade compared to Cedar Falls High School on um, why this was happening there. Um, what was the difference between the school districts? What was the funding differences? Um, so I was kind of interested about that. And that um, interest came from my Schools in American Society course at the University of Northern Iowa which focus on the differences in public, private, and charter schools in the U.S. And I'm gonna to briefly touch on these as well in this next slide here. So public primary schools in short, uh, U.S. Uh, they're funded by the uh, local, state, property, and federal tax dollars in the U.S. and they heavily are uh, limited in what they can teach the education curriculum that they can uh, give their students in their schools, um, such as CRT or the 1690 Project. In addition, state legislation such as House File 802, which I will also discuss, um, here in Boone for shortly. Um, also hindered, uh, or was not able to be passed in the school because of the heavy um, ability that the uh, government has on their education. So private schools in the US are funded by the students' tuition costs, vouchers, parents donations, grants, um, and grants from specific organizations. They are not funded by the government, um, but they are not, and they're also not funded by local, state, or federal tax dollars. And this model allows the private schools to show flexibility and choice in some areas of their education, so they could, per se, um, introduce some of these CRT or 69 project curriculum due to not having a state legislation um, bill that is hindering that. So lastly, charter schools, unlike private schools, do not charge uh, private or do not charge uh, students tuition and are publicly funded, privately managed, and semi-autonomous. They are an alternative to public schools and um, they provide specific educational objectives for their students, faculty, and staff to operate within. They receive funding in similar fashions to primary schools who have additional freedoms over managing their budgets, curriculum, and staffing. So when I went, I went to a primary school when I was in Iowa um, through my high school, uh, kindergarten through high school, it had approximately 700 students in it. Um, and then most of all these students um, were white, unfortunately, uh, from my diversity uh, standpoint. Um, but that left me being one of the only minority students in um, addition to my sister and a few others that were in the school. So um, when conversations around race occurred, um, we're left wondering, you know, why um, some of this stuff happened, and I think that introducing the 1619 Project curriculum to these um, populations could give them the answers to the minority students, and in addition to um, students that are um, not affected by the specific teachings, um, such as white students, that they could also gain a better understanding of the past, present, future in the U.S. Um, and then for me specifically, I would like to know that stuff because now, I, as after this research, I know that, now know that there's systemic and societal barriers that may affect. Um, my existence in this country, so I think that's also really important there. And also for those reasons, this topic remains significant. So next, um, I obviously had to have a research question for my research, and I did qualitative research. So through qualitative research method, I answered the following question. How did Iowa's largest paper, the Des Moines Register frame the issue around CRT and the 1619 project in the state? So as I mentioned, there's some legislation that is in play here. Um, Conversations around the 1619 Project and other curriculum targeting critical race theory education have occurred in Iowa for over two years now. Um, I was still in Iowa when they were starting and were heavily catching traction. Um, and then in June 21, Iowa, Kim Re Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds, who is pictured here, signed the Iowa House File 802, which is banning um, 
some of the discriminatory indoctrination um, things I'll get into here shortly as well. Um, it is described specifically as an act providing requirements related to racism and sexism training, and um, it also limits the diversity and inclusion efforts by government agencies and entities, school districts, and public post-secondary educational institutions. It has several uh, trickling effects, as I mentioned, when, it, when considering my internship opportunity. Um, but it also had several trickling effects for um, educators and students. Advocates of these administration, administrative and legislative actions argued that um, providing students with information on race and racism is un-American, divisive, and in, and in itself racist, and that it, the trend is a result of school personnel being influenced by CRT and embedding it within the curriculum and staff training programs. So specifically, this uh, training program is mentioned, the file um, prohibits two specific types of training, with each including several subsequent items being banned. Um, section 2, 261E.7 uh, bans race and sex stereotyping trainings by institutions, um, and it also bans race and sex scapegoating, stereotyping and teaching um, to specific defined um, concepts. Other legislation, um, as we can see at the, in, or at the national level, has also been put in play here. Um, you can see that it's been federal, state, um, and then as I mentioned as well, um, there's some local uh, conversations that happen and it's targeted public schools, higher education, and government agencies. Um, so in September 2020, former President Donald Trump issued Executive Order 13,950, which was in, put in place to withhold funding from federal entities that promoted nine categories termed advice and concepts, as well as race or sex stereotyping and scapegoating. But this was rescinded in January 2021 by President Biden. Another anti-CRT piece of legislation is the Saving American History Act. This bill prohibits the use of federal funds by an elementary or secondary school to teach a 1619 project or a local educational agency, also known as an LEA, to support its teaching in public schools. And that's not all, as you can see here. There's a few more bills that I've mentioned here that um, are targeting um, CRT as well. The star in the map is Iowa. So as you can see, it, Iowa's light blue, which states that the bill assigned into law or a similar state level action was approved. Iowa actually signed a House bill and a Senate bill into law, so that's why that one's blue. Um, Arizona is going to be, I believe, the one, the blue one, um, I can't point to it here, it's going to be right here, which has a similar effect. And as you can see, other states, Arkansas has an executive order, Florida has a Stop Woke Act, North Dakota has House Bill 50, or 1508, Georgia House Bill 1084, Idaho House Bill 377, and Kentucky House Bill 44 and Senate Bill 1. So now I'm going to get into my literature review a little bit and discuss the CRT tenets. So critical race theory's tenets are defined as principles and beliefs essential to advocates hoping to address the racial inequalities and social outcomes in the U.S. today. There have been additional tenets uh, presented in other uh, CRT-related studies. Um, some have six or even eight tenets, but for the purpose of my study, I only use four. Um, the first one is that race is a makeup, social construct created to classify or categorize humans with experiences of each being different across societies over different times. Second, that although individuals can indeed be racist, racism is, and its outcomes are perpetuated in society through cultural norms, institutional rules, laws, and regulations. Third, that due to the treatment individuals experience based on their racial classification, racism is omnipresent in society, which CRT theorists refer to as normal. Lastly, that while racism is perpetuated at the structural macro level in society, listening to and understanding the lived experiences of individuals is essential for understanding how racism works in our society. So in my research, I specifically looked at framing, uh, which is the process by news media to apply knowingly or unknowingly um, to introduce, present, and discuss topics featured in the news coverage. Framing is important because it is how our news media communication systems construct, define, and produce these meanings um, on a political system social and societal um, level for their audiences. The topic of critical race theory is subjected to framing in particular ways by the news media, which can differ based on publication, as seen in the images here. On one side, it's phrased as, framed as a new way of thinking, and on the other, it's um, framed as a curriculum promoting classroom racism. Previous studies have shown how CRT is framed through the media dialogues, considering American sociologist Joe Feagin's notions of the white racial frame, which I'm using in this study. The white racial frame is drawn on selectively by white individuals acting to impose or maintain white racial identity, privilege, and dominance compared to people of color. This can be seen in domestic news organizations such as Fox News and Tucker Carlson show, for example, which obviously, um, sidebar here, this um, show had its own set of backlashes this week. Um, it's no longer airing on Fox News. 
So um, for not CRT related reasons, for other reasons, but I think that's also important to mention that um, how you frame things and the words you say have meaning and they can have uh, effects. So I have the in, uh, definitions there for the white racial frame and for framing as well. And then I have the two articles there, as you can see from Fox News, Tucker Carlson Show. It says voters are rejecting hurtful school lesson plans which divide our kids. And then on the right side, from MSNBC coverage, it says DeSantis faces backlash as overcooked blocking AP African American studies courses. So those are two different viewpoints on the same issue. Um, both are targeting um, in some way one another, but um, the NBC coverage is saying that, you know, the Republicans are facing backlash while on the left-hand side of Fox News is saying that um, although um, these are being introduced to her little children, which Republicans view as correct in their agenda. So next I'm gonna get into balance and objectivity. Balance news reporting calls on intentionally presenting both sides or all sides of the news stories to the audience, um, which may include additional interviews and research, um, but it must be accurately presented. Without interviews from all sides and viewpoints, reporting may lose credibility and may not be seen as a story for all, but rather a bias or an opinionated report. Balanced news reporting calls on intentionally presenting both sides to the audience. Similar, similarly, objective news, although like balanced reporting, is different. It asks journalists to develop a consistent, transparent method of testing information and evidence in a precise manner, so that personal and cultural biases do not undermine the accuracy of the work presented. It has news that is untainted by any personal biases outside the influences that would appear to present the report differently than what it truly is. Since journalism is uh, technically the bridge between information sources and the audiences, journalism must also be aware of the cultural activity surrounding the story in order to objectively report on it. Information must be presented with knowledge, evidence, expertise, and include diverse perspectives. This puts the citizens receiving the information at the core of the news media um, and the news media organization's loyalty and encourages community trust building, which is an essential step in the news gathering process. A 2010 study on objectivity and balance found that news programs can demonstrate objectivity and balance while also adjusting their news content to color the public or the reader's perceptions. Because audiences may generalize their views on an organization or topics based on a single article, the impressions made by journalists and news sources is crucial in terms of coloring the public's ability to evaluate the content the media portrays in their stories. Scholars studying race and media found that mainstream objective press demonstrate narratives of ignorance, stereotyping, racist framing, and other problems in their coverage. They found that the press has ignored key topics for community colors, such as reparations, affirmative action, and other racial issues. Additionally, these scholars found that journalists tend to highlight extreme positives and negatives when uh, referring to African Americans in their coverage, um, which uh, rather than investigating the deep-rooted causes of their systemic biases. These, these extreme positives and negatives include highlighting the successes of African-American athletes or heavily covering crime and conflict as related to African-Americans and portraying them as villains or criminals. In newspaper coverage of inner ethnic conflict, competing visions of America, scholars Hemant Shah and Michael Thornton analyzed press reports of race-related rioting and found that white reporters failed to include facts of institutional racism while also incorrectly and inevitably covered it, covering white and black riot participation in them. So I'm going to get into my methodologies I use for my research. Um, so communication researchers Martin Bauer and George Gaskill define discourse as um, forms of talk and text, whether it be naturally occurring conversations, interview material, or other um, written text of any kind. Um, and then we use our discourse to not only reflect and describe on the world around us, but also to evoke and persuade individuals and groups into certain beliefs and mindsets. This persuasion occurs when both verbal and written communication are framed through remote or highlight a specific interest, which has prompted communication research, researchers to analyze the dominating themes of discourse and their effects on their audiences. From a linguistic point of view, language can be seen as expressing, indicating, emphasizing, or highlighting news values, or in short, content that is in charge of newsworthy. News values are values constructed, constructed, constructed in and through discourse. Rosalind Gill, a contributor, describes four reoccurring themes in uh, verbal and written discourse I have on the screen here. These are discourse itself, language as a construct, discourse as a form of action, and the rhetorical organization of discourse. The first concern with discourse itself is very common because, as I mentioned earlier, many of us are unaware that the words that we say have perceived meaning. And secondly, that, they are, that the way that they are constructed matters. Saying that critical race theory is a Republican issue is different than saying that Republicans have an issue with critical race theory. Differing language construction and framing allows the public perception to take hold and that these different, view, different views emerge. News discourse also stems from a position of power that reports raw information in the conventionally accepted mode of representation that will eventually appear in various mediums. It is often able to influence people's minds and what they think, but may not directly influence their actions or their behaviors. 
News media also, to some extent, have, continues to have more access to elite individuals and power ins powerful institutions than others, despite the advancements of social media and the ability social media has to connect people in our world. For these reasons, analyzing news discourse for the thesis seemed to be the logical recourse to examine the conversations being had by powerful people and institutions in Iowa surrounding the ban of critical race theory in public schools and their organizations. How CRT was framed and reflected in this discourse helped gain insight into the processes that led the state of Iowa eventually banning critical race theory curriculum from their primary public institutions. Two strategies can be utilized to qualify or to quantify the biases of news media outlets. First, analyzing the readership. Um, assuming that the content and attitudes of the news outlet ends up driving the biases of their audiences. And secondly, by inspecting the outlet's public, published content, focusing on coverage of important events. So the Moines Register, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit here, which was the paper I used for my analyzation. Um, Des Moines itself is the largest metropolitan area and city in Iowa. It's the state's capital and it has approximately 220,000 residents with a total metropolitan area housing approximately 700,000 people. The Des Moines Register itself has a circulation that surpasses 100,000 people and was known initially as the Iowa Star, but was purchased by the Gannett Company in 2014. Before it was sold, the Gannett Company had won more Pulitzer Prizes for a national reporting than any other newspaper in the U.S., except for the New York Times. They had won 16, so when that was stated, they had won 16 at the time. I chose the right to um, do this paper based on all sides media, which labeled the Des Moines Register, which is a USA affiliate, as having a central bias based on their online news media coverage. Its news articles do not reliably favor opinions on either side of the political aisle, and its editorial board often exhibits both conservative and liberal biases. It was, all, it was also chosen due to having a large circulation of any paper within the state. So how my data was collected from the Des Moines Register, I also used um, the University of Arizona Libraries ProQuest of the Des Moines Register, which was provided by the University of Arizona School of Journalism Library, Mary Feeney. Um, I used several search terms to collect my sample from the time period spanning 2020 to 2022. These include critical race theory, CRT, advice of concepts, race, 1619, 1619 Project, the 1619 Project, and Nicole Anna Jones. I determined that 2020 to 2022 was a good time period for analysis due to the predominant articles on the topic coming around that time, because um, that's when CRT and the 1619 Project have gained popularity. Additionally, Nicole Anna Jones won her Pulitzer Prize for the topic in um, 2020, so that was uh, chosen as the initial start date. I collected a total of 50 articles for my sample. Uh, 42 were totally examined, and 16 of those 42 were chosen by, uh, or were authored or co-authored by a single journalist, uh, Ian Richardson. Um, other master students, or other master students at accredited universities, such as the University of Texas um, and the University of Missouri Columbia, have used 50 sources or 50 articles for the sample size. Um, so, based on these private precedents, I assume that my sample size was sufficient. Um, 38 of my articles, as I mentioned, came directly from the Des Moines Register, and then the additional 12 came from the ProQuest searching the Des Moines Register offered by the university. I employed a qualitative approach to explore my data and my data analysis within the context of critical race theory and framing. So to conduct my discourse analysis, I first clearly defined my research question and articles to analyze to answer that question. An established social and historical understanding was necessary, so I gathered additional facts and details regarding who wrote the content, when and where the content was published. I then determined themes and patterns in the material that were relevant to answering my research question, including words, sentences, paragraphs, and even the story structure itself. Finally, after concluding and conducting my analysis, I reflected on the results to examine the meanings of the language used to consider the topic in a broader context. In the end, 38 of my articles reduced from my sample, which was not ideal, um, but after you know, I initially um, defended my proposal for this thesis, I already had my sample, it was found that um, several of the articles were posted in the paper and then online, and they were using different headlines with the same story. So I had 38 total stories in my sample, which was not ideal, but 42 articles have been used in other stories to examine um, specific events, so I felt confident with my sample size. So um, I additionally was wanting to interview uh, the journalist I mentioned, Ian Richardson, uh, but unfortunately he had moved on to a different uh, news organization when I reached out to interview him. So I reached out to the paper um, again to interview their executive editor, Carol Hunter. Um, I hoped to interview her, obviously, but she was, um, um, as I'll mention in my limitations section, she was unable to connect. So these were the questions I planned to ask her um, to analyze her opinions on the Moines Register and how Ian Richardson covered his stories. Um, so I can uh, just leave them there for you guys to take a quick look at. Um, and then, yeah, so there were a little bit um, different questions for Ian, and then once Ian was unable to meet due to being um, relocating, um, I had to pivot, and then unfortunately I was unable to connect with her, as I mentioned, uh, 
here later on. So in my results and findings, I found that articles ranged in topics from the introduction and passing of Iowa House and Senate files aimed at stopping critical race theory education to Iowa students, faculty, staff, and government employees and more. Um, in addition, the, the actions that are being taken by Iowa school board members and districts um, to act upon the imposed legislation, um, and then also the disagreements and discourse and legislation that occurred. So my first finding, is that the Republican Party tried to flip the narrative of critical race theory by claiming that CRT is used to explain history to students in a similar um, way of saying that racism or being racist, or it's similar to saying that racism or being racist to teach American racism is what be, is being done by teaching this uh, curriculum. So as quoted from one story article, Iowa House Representative Steve Holt, Republican Party, uh, quoted Martin Luther King Jr.'s Iowa Dream speech several times um, as he, um, in his dialogue, tried to build a pass um, in the Iowa House. So that was one thing, flipping the narrative from uh, something that's considered uh, typically uh, not that, that it's you know, considered, as I previously mentioned, to talk about the racial makeup of our society, and then rather teach, saying that it's um, being racist and teaching racism to teach the 69th Project. Another finding I had is that the Republican Party invoked religious and political ideologies by referring to critical race theory education as discriminatory indoctrination on students in the state, and the state theory amounts to cultural Marxism. This narrative um, falls in the frame of defending American heritage and, uh, and patriotism, which is put forth by Professor Abe Fierstein in his project titled School Curriculum in the News, Black Lives Matter, and the Continuing Struggle for Culturally Responsive Education. Several stories in the sample analyzed in the CISOs were framed in this narrative, and have Republican policymakers in Iowa promoting the anti-CRT bills by claiming that it is telling white children that because they are white, they are racist, which is the equivalent to indoctrination. They, they being Republicans, are saying that instead, students must learn to judge one another based off, of, based off of their character traits versus the color of their skin, which as we can see, and based off the initial slide as well, is flipping the narrative. Additionally, narratives within this frame promote pride in American heritage, which can be achieved by not discussing the country's racist, slave-owning past, but rather the greatness of our nation and all that we have achieved. Um, and here you can see on the top right, I have a picture here from a Fox um, correspondence or Fox coverage that says that federal funds should not have should not be used to support activists in schools who want to teach our kids to hate each other and their country. Another finding I have. Um, comes from a social contextual perspective, and that's that the Republican representatives use the word racist to refer to critical race theory over and over again in this um, analyzation. Um, and then they uh, talk about systemic and institutional racism persists in American society. society. Um, they don't talk about uh, the systemic and institutional racism presented in American society because of its history of slavery, um, and which is a reflection of the privilege that white races continue to enjoy in this country. By appropriating the same word that blacks use to express discriminatory, discriminatory behavior and treatment put onto them, white people in general, or by society at large, um, the Republican Party represents shunned, representatives shunned any further discussion about individual and systemic racism in the U.S. and to those about the U.S. inspiration past. The Republican Party in Iowa paradoxically used their power and privilege to change the historical narrative Iowa and students will hear moving forward. Additionally, by comparing teaching critical race theory to dis discriminatory indoctrination, the Iowa State Republican Party can vote comparisons to ideologically charged teachings that command black followings. For example, some Republican representatives equated critical race theory with cultural Marxism, drawing similarities between CRT and communism, an, ide an ideology that most Americans strongly disagree with. On um, the Des Moines Register News report, the Des Moines Register News report quoted the Iowa House of Representatives um, Republican Skyler Wheeler from Warren City who stated, that follow stated the following to explain cultural Marxism during a debate on the House floor. It means that one group of people, due to something they can't control, such as their skin or their gender, are oppressors. And other groups of people, due to something they can't control, such as their skin or their gender, are the oppressors. There's no room or opportunity for looking at the content of people's characters or other factors, just skin color or gender. And as you can see at the top right here, I have a picture that says judge character, not skin color. No CRT. Lastly, um, I thought it was important to note that many of the articles in my sample started with the Republican Party's position first, um, such as the success of passing Iowa House File 802, versus the counter argument that usually followed towards the bottom of the story that was a Democrat opinion. From a new story structure perspective, such as the inverted pyramid, the most important information is always placed at the top of the story, while the, important, while the information and decreasing levels of importance is placed towards the bottom. 
It is therefore possible that the Moines Register express what is and what is not important to them without explicitly, explicitly stating so, while providing perspectives from both parties at the same time. Thus, even with even though balance was maintained by reporting on all sides, by simply placing one perspective and point or point of view higher in the story than the other, the newspaper examined one perspective over the other. Another point to be noted is that the majority of the articles were written by one reporter. Therefore, many stories follow a similar story structure. This possibly highlights the issue of the journalistic practice of only having one person covering one beat at a time. An individual covering the same beat, writing the same story in an inverted pyramid style from, from the beginning may begin to replicate the story out of boredom or for efficiency. What this does, however, is recreate the same narrative and thus perspective because it is louder and in the news and it gets highlighted more and more over other perspectives. Stories that focus on racist bullying faced by high school students and school authorities dealing with representation or repercussions of House Bill 802 on their teachings and curriculum and, to, and stories that discuss the 1619 project um, were formatted in that same way. They had the Republican views at the top with the uh, sentiment opinions at the bottom. Thus, the findings here suggest that it may be useful for newspapers to consider having more than one person work on one beat so that different narratives for the same story can be published for the public. The findings here also show that it's easy to listen to the loudest voice, Republican Party House members and the governor in Iowa, who is also Republican. These individuals were given a lot of newspaper real estate to put forth their narratives that fell neatly within the white racial frame and the defending American heritage uh, patriotism frames. Stories that contain challenging dominant narrative frames were few and far between. So the study began by asking how did Iowa's largest newspaper, the Des Moines Register, frame the issue around critical race theory in the 1619 project in the state. And I used the methodologies of discourse analysis and framing analysis, which revealed that the Des Moines Register's reporting highlighted the white racial frame, the defending American heritage and patriotism frame, and challenges the dominant narrative frame. In news discourse analyzed, narratives usually fell into one or two of these three frames, while the white racial frame and defending American heritage and patriotism frames primarily emerged from news stories that focus on the Republican Party and their arguments for passing House Bill 802. Challenging the dominant narrative frame was prevalent in stories that focus on school diversity efforts to listen to their students, train teachers in white privilege and diversity for their curriculum, as well as introduce stories that describe the daily bullying and racist comments that these students and colors were subjected to in Iowa high schools. This frame also emerged in new stories where school officials tried to distance their coursework and teachings related to diversity and inclusion from critical race theory. An interesting point that emerged from the study as well was that how the Republican Party officials appropriated the language of oppression used by black community members at large, at large to point out systemic racism. Republican Party officials claimed that teachings about slavery in the past were discriminatory, racist in nature, and promoted the indoctrination of students, thus flipping the racial narrative in their favor. On the other hand, Democratic officials and black activists called on the acting the act of passing House Bill yet another expression of white oppression and the exercise of power and privilege. So as I previously mentioned, this study had or this research had some limitations. One limitation I found was that the stories collected after the sample were using um, certain search terms that could have been biased towards the sample, um, and a different combination of search terms may have provided um, a different selection of stories. This is an important limitation because the study could possibly um, be addressed differently by scholars if they were to use different search terms. Another limitation I found was that um, I requested, as mentioned, an interview from journalist Ian Richardson, picture at the top right there. However, um, he left the paper due to other opportunities he was pursuing, so I was unable to interview him. Um, due to this, an interview um, was uh, requested from the Moines Register Executive Editor, Editor Carol Hunter, pictured at the bottom right here. Um, unfortunately, she was also unable to meet due to time constraints. Um, so, um, therefore, the Des Moines Register's editorial policy and decision making for particular news stories is not known. And arguably, this paper was able to provide another perspective other than what was stated in the news reporting by being unable to meet. Um, future research could possibly examine the reasons um, behind the paper's philosophy on news coverage on these important issues as well. So this research basically just confirmed my belief that the Moyne Register did attempt to maintain balance in the reporting. And although that they did strive to achieve this, there were several aspects that affected how the message is delivered. This includes race, political ideology, and the framing and discourse used by the newspapers to report on it. The introduction, passing, and signing of House Bill 802, and the banning of critical race theory, 1619 Project, and any form of education that is even remotely related to these topics in the state. Additionally, as news media organizations look to each other to understand how to make sense of these issues and the best way to report on them, what well, one newspaper of record and repute does, such as the Des Moines Register, has repercussions for how the other papers may um, create their own coverage of uh, similar topics. In, in conclusion, the study allowed for an increased understanding of the power of framing and discourse, the effects the discourse has on readers, and assisted in my understanding why certain populations carry the leaders on critical race theory curriculum. Thank you.
now I'll open it up to a Q&A portion for those of you here. I don't know if anyone in the chat wants to drop uh, questions in the chat. If you have any, feel free. Who, who's on, is um, Monica on the uh, Zoom? Or? Monica's sick. Monica's um, on Zoom. Yeah, and Susan's gonna be here, so we're recording it for them. Okay, um, Susan has her. Yeah, whatever. and so we're, um, I'm gonna send them it to them today. And then they'll be in touch with you. Well, unfortunately, I didn't see that I had the admins waiting to join. So this will be um, recorded, and I can send it out to you guys after the presentation concludes. I think it's really interesting that, um, thank you, I think that was great. Um, oh, I think it's really interesting, too, that, to note that the reporters who were recording were white mm -hmm. reporting on these issues. And right. I'm, I'm interested to see if you would have seen, a, had a different result if there had been at least one of them who was a person of color. Right. So 16 of the 50 articles that were written by were written by Ian Richardson, who was white. And yeah. then, um, there were five, I believe, other authors in my sample. Um, and then two of those, one was African American and one was uh, Mexican American. Okay. So there, but um, mm -hmm. to be honest, because there was so much coverage and repetition in the um, style and structure of the reporting, it was consistent across Interesting. Races. Yeah. That's very I guess cool. specifically in Iowa, looking at that. Really? As a, that's really interesting. Yeah. Jeff? Cedar Falls is a predominantly white community. Right. I think you mentioned there were three black kids in the. Is it still that way? So Cedar Falls is still predominantly white, yep. So Waterloo and Cedar Falls is actually subject to being a red line district. Um, in the past, it was determined that it was that. Um, so because of that, some of these things um, are obviously make sense that one town has better schools than the other. Um, one town has a higher African American population, the other substantially higher actually. Um, all, most of all African Americans in the state of Iowa are centered in the Waterloo Super Falls area, specifically in Waterloo due to um, the cost of living and things like that. Um, and services provided there for um, those races that might not be available in other more rural communities. So um, yeah, there is, I think it's still, but yeah, predominantly Cedar Falls is a very um, affluent and uh, wealthy um, school district. I, I, I think maybe it was in our discussions, and I don't. I just can't put it down. But we're, we're talking about uh, people do go, doing their work and then going home, uh, and they might say something different to their family than they they said uh, what they wrote in the paper that day. Right. Could you talk a little bit about that? About the personal and the professional. Right. Way? So as I mentioned a little bit before, um, you have to leave your bias at the door, right, when you're reporting on issues like this, you can't bring it um, into your reporting in a way that, um, I guess at all really, but in any way that would show bias within the reporting or that the reports heavily lean towards one another, right? So that'd be like an opinion piece or a, a letter to the editor per se. So that, I guess, when it comes to coming home and having a different um, set of beliefs, I think that maybe journalism would allow you to gain more understanding on the beliefs and on the issue itself by doing that coverage of that objective balance reporting. So it would be, you know, you come home and have that conversation that, you know, I believe this and this and this, but this is where I report it, this is what the other side thinks. But I think it's also good for the conversation itself, so. So, the, what do you, what do you take away? You've, you've done this immense amount of work. Right. Yeah. Uh, opportunity arose, and it, it, it's just great the way you grabbed the opportunity. That, that internship never worked out. I didn't, you know. I ended up doing a journalism internship, which worked out still, because I was already coming to school here for my master's, but I ended up just going and working for a publication instead of doing that. So what, uh, what, what kind of your personal, you, you've gone through this exercise, yeah. so what, are you optimistic? So, are you depressed? Um, you yeah, um, regarding the Des Moines Magistrates news media coverage, they have, they have like three politics reports. So it's going to be the same three people reporting on anything related to this topic. So in that sense, I don't have hope in terms of the reporting changing in any way, at least within the next, like, really soon, per se. Um, over the period of time, as you know, the paper could potentially grow, they could get more people, they could listen to some of this um, review and having more than one person covering the beat, then I think that the conversation could be, could be more um, wholehearted. Um, in addition, these conversations are happening at like school board meetings and they're happening on people that are running for you know office in different uh, places, whether that's local, state, federal, or not in the state of Iowa that are becoming politically charged as well. So I think that it's becoming, because it's such a politically charged issue, it's also weighing into the fact that it's very hard to cover and conversations are very cutthroat in this um, 
in, in this topic specifically. What would you, what would you, I'd be interested to know what you think if you take away, if you call things different, you use different names for things. Do you think that's so like, meta, like do it using like the kind of metaphors? They say critical race theory come up with a right. Software. So metaphorically naming it something else yeah. that would like kind of mean the same thing. Um, yeah, I think that would be. I mean, obviously, that's that's the thing. Is the words we use have have meaning and they become charged, right? So now critical race race theory is this charged term and charged theory that a lot of people, frankly, don't know or don't have a lot of information on. Um, they're just getting it from news. They're getting it from opinion pieces. So I think maybe that could be um, something, you know, you could say, um, I don't know, critical race theory can name it something completely different and still find a way to talk about the issue that someone could, you know, not have any idea that they're even talking about critical race theory, really. So you could kind of you know, get to them that way. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, finding ties and comparisons that you can make um, within stuff like these racial um, co conflicts is important to make ties um, so that everyone can gain an understanding. And I don't want to dominate here, but a, huge, a final question. Okay. Has your thinking changed? I don't want to say advanced. Has your thinking changed from when you started the project to when you finished the project? Um, regarding critical race theory, I've just gotten more educated on the issue from my reporting. I have a lot of literature in my um, thesis here about critical race theory itself. So in that sense, um, no. But um, I guess specifically looking at my research question, how it was framed, um, and then how that affects, yeah, how that affects your audiences, that, that's changed a lot. I realize now that, the, that like even the simple words in the headline, and the story, the structure of your story, even though looking back at my two years in the program, we've talked about using the inverted pyramid as a style to, to write, just to write, to get your points hit. Now looking at it in terms of what well, you can use that style, which is journalistically correct, and putting everything at the bottom is where no one's gonna to get to it at that point, right? I can write this thesis and I can put everything at the very end. And how many of you would probably gotten to it today? Probably not many. So stuff like that, looking at the structure um, is important too. So I think that's changed a lot of my, um, I guess, ideas regarding the actual effect of writing the story and the structure and the words and what you put where, interviews that you put where, people that you include, that's all changed, yeah. Well, it's a nice piece of work. Thank you. A lot of work. Yeah, a lot of work, very, very quick. Any other questions, comments? Anyone in here? I'm sorry, I've been, <laughs> I've been looking. I've won the chat. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sean, I'll ask, um, you know, you've spent a lot of time on this, and it seems like you did a really, you know, obviously, a super thorough job with your, with your thesis. Um, but, you know, you, so you've had some time to reflect on it now. Right. Is there anything that you wish you would have included, anything you would have done differently, or do you feel like this is played out to how you envisioned it? Yeah, um, I wish I could, those interviews really were the big thing. I think that would have told me a lot regarding the uh, questions I have regarding the structure and having one person cover the beat. You know, I could ask, is that an editorial thing that you only have one person covering this beat, or is it a money issue? What is, what is the cause? Um, and then in addition, where does this paper stand regarding their balance and objectivity? Um, I guess um, ethics, because as I mentioned, a lot of the stuff was at the very bottom of the story with the Republicans up at the top. So, without stating an opinion, in my opinion, they did save an opinion by doing that in their coverage, because all the people are only going to read this top, and then they're going to, you know, they might get to the end and get the opinion there, but they might not. So, I have two questions. I have a whole sort of questions. Um, first one you mentioned that your sample size was smaller in part because. You found that the headlines were different mm -hmm. online. Yep. Um, I think that's interesting, yeah. kind of weird. I don't know if that's a general practice in the I, word. I never found that anywhere. And it was okay. a surprise to me when I went to, when I was doing my data analysis and I opened up an article and I'm like, oh, that looks really familiar to what I read like 10 minutes ago. And then I would go back to that article and it'd be the exact same text, but the headline was different. Yeah. So I think that that might have to do with them putting one in the paper and one on the online version of the yeah. uh, publication. Um, but that's also something where it's like, that I mentioned too as a limitation, I use certain search terms. So I was given mm -hmm. the same story twice with different headlines. Right. So, and that could also have something to do too with the structure itself within the, or that could have been a question for the interview too regarding the structures. Why is there 
one story being put out twice in two different places with different headlines. Right, are they trying to grab different right. readers? Yeah. yeah, and the headlines or, weren't, weren't heavily different either. So mm -hmm. they weren't like recent. Oh, was they restructure the stories? No, like no, all? everything was the exact same, same oh. author. So I thought I was getting a different story from the same author as I would already maybe had previously, and then it was the same like, story. Is that so, not self-plagiarism? Yeah, it's just, it's just... And that's why I think I would want to know, because I right. wonder yeah. if it's just posting one on the online versus the yeah. paper and the hard copy. But, right. Because, yeah. like, like, at least from my experience, too, when I have something published and it goes hard copy and online, it's, it's the exact it's same, same, same story. Thing. It's yeah. the exact same title. And I wonder if they're trying to kind of skate around right. and like use different terminology online to appeal to different people right. or what? Or the same story too. So that's exactly. Right. So that's but, it's, but that's that initial headline that gets you. Right. So, you know, um, the second question I has what, had was, um, I mean, I'd like to, to be optimistic and think that maybe the Des Moines Register is not like consciously aware right. of your findings, you know? Mm -hmm. But like, have you thought of essentially maybe even like approaching them and saying, hey, I did this research, I did this qualitative information. I just want to let you know what my findings were. Right. And um, well, my paper, my paper or my thesis of manuscript words, my limitations a little bit differently than I did in my presentation. They were very, um, Carol Hunter specifically was very pushing against me. Oh, to, to talk. Um, I gave her the interview questions beforehand. Um, she said she couldn't meet during this week, so I'm like, okay, what about next week? What about the week after that? Like, I'm, this is February at this point. I have months to finish this still. So, um, but yeah, I think it'd be, I wonder what would happen if I did present yeah. that this, this yeah, research. And also the, yeah, it's just the person who wrote all of it isn't, not all of it, the person who wrote 16 of the articles in my sample isn't working there anymore either, so. But that was a lot of my analyzation, so it really wouldn't be a conflict of interest there either. So, yeah, um, I think it would be would be a good thing to do. Yeah, and then at least you know it's in their hands. And it'd be worthwhile so, like, too because and that could be a follow up story. Hey, mm -hmm. I gave them this information. Let's see if you don't know if they like an editor. They make yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I really oh, I'm sorry, but I'm like, you know, the thesis. Yeah, follow up a year from now. Maybe when I get maybe if I go PhD. <laughs> no, but I mean, I mean, and I don't know if you plan on um, being an active journalist or not, but I mean, that would be something to to come back on and say, and, and even for a research article and say, hey, you know, I'm, you know, to, to do a follow up on, I gave this information, I yeah. did these, I took these steps, they still don't have a, di a diverse, you know, right. they still don't you have, know, they still don't have, they still have the same person, too. Yeah. you know. Here is an, a reanalyzation of the newest stuff in the last year, and it follows the same path. So obviously, they don't care. Right. You know, I mean, yeah, I feel like it'd be totally worth Even if you just send them an email that, like, look, this is what my research kind of concluded, and if they do nothing with that, then that's yeah. on them. But I think it's like worth, at least worth trying to yeah. put it in front of their face. Oh, that's a good idea. Especially since you did all this work on it too, I yeah, feel like okay. it'd be, it could be rewarding if you're able to enact a change on their end. And it could very well be, yeah, but they, they haven't even thought about it. Yeah. Yeah. They don't, you know. Yeah. Uh, this is all the so, yeah, I didn't ask that question. This company as a whole have the company. No, that's uh, an editorial policy. Or would this likely have been explored in the interviews? Yep, I would have asked them that in the interviews because that's in their editorial policy. 